All right, I think we are good to get started. I see still a few more people trickling in, but I think now is a good time to um, get the show on the road. So thank you everyone for coming this morning. Um, this is a webinar uh, by Rapid Novor uh, titled Ant Alpaca Antibody Showdown, Selecting Specific Monoclonal Antibodies by SPR. Uh, my name is Jen and I'll be the moderator today and Marco is our speaker. And just some announcements, we will be doing a Q&A session at the end. So at the bottom bar of the Zoom, you can type any questions you have in that Q&A button. And the session is also being recorded, so we'll be sending that out at the end of the presentation as well. Today we'll start with a story about a team who were trying and failing to find uh, drug candidates that worked in vivo. They'd produced a drug against CRF1 and for various reasons it could not proceed, so they were trying to generate new candidates against the same target. Their new candidates seemed to work in a 90 minute in vitro competition assay but failed in vivo. They were binding, but they were only uh 10 percent as potent as their previous lead molecule why after extensive head scratching and experimentation they determined that the residence time of their original molecule was nearly 10 times the new ones simply put it stuck around longer so it was more effective they learned from this and included new screening criteria in their subsequent work if you want to choose the best antibodies to proceed with into preclinical tox studies or to develop an ideal IVD assay, you need to understand not only how, to, how tightly they bind, but also how fast they bind and how long they stick around. This is called binding kinetics. It reveals a lot more than an endpoint assay. Marco uh, leads Rapid Novor's antibody kinetics team with over 15 years of experience in antibody optimization and development. He is using the power of SPR to realize the full potential of Rapid Novor's unique de novo antibody sequencing platform in development of, next, of the next generation of biologics. Prior to joining Rapid Novor, Mar Marco held leadership roles in biotech and academia, he has successfully implemented numerous antibody development projects, ranging from high throughput met metabolic screens at the National Institute of Health to the development of new nanotechnology-based SPR applications at Nicoya Life Sciences, one of the distributors in the SPR field. Marco is passionate about the potential of the biosensors field and as the head of training and development at Nicoya has trained hundreds of researchers in the exciting science of SPR. He continues to innovate and author papers at intersection of SPR, nanotechnology and antibody development. Welcome Marco. Well, thank you Jennifer for that very kind introduction. And I would also like to thank uh, all of our um, the participants today and also those of you who might be watching a recording of this webinar. We have a very exciting session today and we'll be diving into the um, kinetics uh, and the role of uh, uh, surface plasma resonance in particular in accelerating antibody discovery. But we'll start with our alpaca story. We have a very um, exciting development on the polyclonal sequencing front that we would like to share with you today. And we'll use that story as a backdrop to explore the importance of kinetics in uh, the um, full antibody discovery pipeline, how it can accelerate your research, how it can accelerate uh, you know, the um, uh, lead uh, development all the way to preclinical and clinical uh, trials. And we will uh, touch on the uh, unique advantage of our rapid SPR service, how it can be used for uh, screening of the uh, initial uh, lead candidates all the way to full characterization and epitope mapping uh, and uh, binning. Um, we will round things off with um, and, uh, basically just a, a couple of ways that you can connect with us and uh, uh, get going with your next antibody kinetic project here at Rapid Nowhere. But we start our story with alpaca uh, polyclonal success. So for, following the 
um, initial um, successes with uh, de novo polyclonal sequencing of uh, rabbit, sheep, dog, and goat uh, species. Uh, we have recently succeeded in um, uh, doing the same thing with the first camelid species. So uh, we were uh, able to essentially uh, determine individual sequences of uh, clones from a polyclonal mixture of antibodies coming from an alpaca. Uh, we have a whole webinar dedicated to this particular platform and very interesting new technology that uh, does not use B cells or any other um, uh, type of more standard approaches, but actually uh, is essentially is capable of uh, providing individual single clone sequences directly from the serum, de novo. In a nutshell, um, whether it's alpaca or a rabbit or uh, any other species, uh, once it's immunized, we can uh, take the serum and uh, following the affinity purification, uh, we can uh, process it by LC-MSMS and using our AI-driven algorithm and a lot of machine learning that goes into this process, we can um, uh, elucidate the final individual sequences of uh, top clones found in the initial polyclonal mixture. Now, you can imagine this is a very powerful um, technology in accelerating uh, antibody discovery. So this service we refer to as a REPAP service, and uh, we'll touch upon that also towards the end of the webinar, if you're interested in that specifically. But also this type of a technology is uh, perfectly complementary and has a very strong synergy with uh, the kinetic analysis that we perform using surface plasma resonance, um, and, and that being a gold standard in uh, antibody kinetic analysis. So just to demonstrate, the true power of that type of synergy. What we'll be sharing you, with you today is uh, a study where we took the top clones identified in the alpaca project and we um, analyzed them uh, with different uh, surface plasma resonance uh, methods to identify uh, an ideal uh, candidate for an application that required a selective and a long binding monoclonal uh, antibody from that pool. So um, the two targets that we were uh, analyzing were um, the uh, anti-integrin antibody, uh, uh, P17 monoclonal antibody, and uh, a CD3 epsilon monoclonal antibody. Um, essentially, our uh, ideal candidate uh, was uh, to exhibit preference or uh, selective binding only for the anti-P17 uh, uh, monoclonal and uh, also doing so at the high affinity, so below 10 nanomolar for the uh, actual KD, as well as uh, exhibiting a uh, slow dissociation rate. The idea being that once it binds, it remains bound to the target for a long time. Um, with this type of project, again, uh, we started uh, the uh, polyclonal sequencing by immunizing alpaca, uh, extracting the uh, polyclonal uh, uh, antibodies from the serum directly and uh, performing de novo sequencing using our um, AI algorithm, ultimately ending up with uh, a series of sequences that we could then use for recombinant expression of individual clones. Uh, in total, there were six top candidates that were selected for further study. And uh, out of those six candidates, um, we were uh, able to um, uh, observe uh, binding in high uh, uh, high affinities, so in a nanomolar to picomolar range of uh, several of the candidates against the P17 target as well as the CD3 target. So we started off with the standard assay, which is ELISA endpoint assay, and uh, essentially this is a good way to do a quick screen. Uh, it is a, a standard part of the antibody development process. And just to contrast that, what I'll show you is just uh, essentially the, uh, at the very end, the uh, end result of our kinetic analysis and how it compares to some of the standard assays. So what we're looking at here is essentially the analysis of the same clones uh, using surface plasma resonance. So shown here is uh, isoaffinity comparative analysis plot for uh, the P17 monoclonal target 
and uh, CD3 um, monoclonal target. Uh, with these types of plots, um, what we uh, the way that um, we can um, ex really uh, get deeper insights into the uh, kinetic uh, profiles of various antibodies. The, the way we do that is essentially we plot the off rate uh, against on the uh, x-axis against the on rate uh, Ka on the y-axis. Uh, so we'll go into details of uh, this, the, the whole process of how we get these numbers, how we determine the off rate and the on rate of each of these clones uh, in this webinar. Uh, but just for uh, just to give you a flavor of what we'll be covering, essentially uh, we can come up with a very uh, detailed analysis even with this small set, but also what is even more powerful is imagine that you had dozens or even 100 antibodies and doing this kind of analysis, you can identify uh, specific binders. So in this case, we see that uh, clones R7 and R1 are um, uh, essentially uh, showing selectivity uh, in a specific uh, preference for P17. Uh, and out of those, we were able to identify that R7 is the only one that has uh, uh, high affinity binding, so KB below uh, 10 nanomolar, so that would be below uh, to the left of this diagonal line in the center, and then also um, showing a slow off rate. So if you simply look at the um, x-axis here, you can see that uh, the uh, off rate here is very close to the uh, highest affinity clones that do not show the type of selectivity we were looking for. And we also were able to identify that R1, even though it does show quite a bit of um, um, uh, affinity towards uh, P17, it does not meet the, this ideal criteria for uh, further uh, antibody development. So again, so what we'll focus on is the step-by-step -step process of getting from this point of the initial screen to a really deep reach insight that you can get with surface plasma resonance and analysis of this type, such as isoaffinity comparative analysis. And um, to understand it, we'll just step back and talk a little bit about the general role uh, of kinetics in antibody dis discovery. And I also encourage you, as we go through this and as we discuss it, to imagine uh, uh, how this process can actually be accelerated with new technologies such as REPAP. So, the you know sequencing of uh, polyclonal antibodies and uh, developments like that in the field are really uh, making a difference in expediting this pipeline and potentially even skipping some of the steps um, of the process uh, as, as you know, these technologies are becoming more and more integrated. So this is a really exciting new development in the field in general. Now here we're looking at the a standard antibody discovery pipeline for a potential therapeutic antibody, but a, a, similar, a similar type of pipeline you'll uh, see with diagnostic uh, antibodies as well as uh, antibodies developed for other purposes, such as screening, point of care devices and such. Uh, in general, uh, the, the starting point is always target identification and validation, looking at your antigen, its uh, properties, and uh, leading to uh, the antibody discovery phase. This is the phase where, again, uh, having a technology that um, can uh, sequence polyclonal antibodies directly from the serum makes a difference because uh, not only does it accelerate the process, but it also provides you with sequences of the actual most relevant clones uh, from the immune response. So you don't have potential limitations of the biology that comes with including you know, B cells and other intermediate steps to get into the final uh, sequences of uh, those clones. That uh, step of the process funnels down to testing and lead selection. So uh, this is where uh, we re rely heavily on SPR, surface plasma resonance, is a gold standard in uh, antibody discovery when it comes to kinetics, uh, as well as uh, epitope binning. And this works really well uh, hand in hand with uh, HDX uh, MS, which provides us with uh, detailed mapping of the interaction between the uh, epitope and the uh, uh, antibody surface, the peritope that's binding to that epitope. 
Um, in addition, this is the stage where uh, stability testing, functional assays, and cross-reactivity are also uh, tested. And that leads to further antibody engineering and optimization. So with, these, with the kinetic information in hand, structural information on the nature of the 3D interaction between the antibody uh, and the antigen, um, and the sequence, uh, we can then further optimize uh, these uh, leads into really the top candidates that are then processed for uh, uh, final characterization and uh, downstream uh, uh, preclinical studies. So um, what uh, we uh, see as you know really um, you know an important part of the process is integration of these different stages and creating synergy between the uh, again sequencing uh, and uh, uh, the uh, screening and validation as well as kinetic analysis. So um, uh, the part of the process that is uh, critical for the success of the pipeline is really you know it, uh, if identifying those several top candidates going from the initial endpoint assay such as ELISA to SPR stability test that is uh, a little bit more sensitive as you know, it, it does use a constant flow system rather than an endpoint assay uh, or a dip and read assay such as uh, BLI. And uh, once you have a couple of top candidates in hand, uh, those are the ones that you would then process uh, uh, through um, uh, kinetic analysis on surface plasma resonance platform and also perform isofinity analysis. So comparative kinetic analysis, looking at individual parameters and really a mining for you know, the ideal profile, uh, depending on the application. So uh, once this phase is completed, then we can move into potentially epitope binning if multiple antibodies are used. And there are many reasons for that, whether it's a uh, blocking antibody cocktail, where you're looking for antibodies that might be binding to discrete epitopes for the purpose of blocking a particular pathogen, or um, uh, antibodies that might need to have uh, complementary discrete epitopes uh, for the purpose of developing maybe a lateral flow assay or a point of care device. Ultimately, so uh, also that interaction uh, needs to be mapped out. And uh, uh, what, the, what we offer also in-house is uh, HDX MX technology. So uh, a mass spec uh, technology that enables us to identify actual amino acids participating in that interaction on the epitope and the peritope. Uh, today's webinar will be focusing on the kinetics side of things. And uh, uh, we'll be using, again, alpaca story as sort of a backdrop and uh, uh, a, a use case. Uh, but this is just the beginning of the story. We have uh, a second part of this uh, webinar series coming up uh, late, uh, early next year that will focus on uh, the, the same uh, alpaca antibody set, but in the context of binning and uh, epitope mapping. So stay tuned for that. So to understand really the uh, unique uh, power and advantage of using surface plasma resonance in antibody development. We'll, we'll, we'll just touch quickly on the basics of surface plasma resonance, how it works, and uh, what is um, the uh, type of system that we use in house, why we use it, and um, how it also uh, integrates with uh, technology downstream. So, at the very basic level, Surface plasma resonance is a simple, very straightforward biophysical technique in which you can uh, study the kinetics of an interaction between two biomolecules uh, that can be antibody and an antigen, so or in general protein-protein interactions, as well as uh, other biomolecules. We can study uh, DNA, RNA um, interactions, as well as carbohydrates and lipids. So uh, it's it's a very diverse. A technique that uh, also uh, does not require any labeling. So that is another advantage. So uh, you can study unlabeled binding partners where one of the binding partners is immobilized on a gold surface and using the uh, inherent property of gold, uh, we can detect the uh, binding of the, the binding partner that is found in solution and is passed uh, through the microfluidic system over the immobilized uh, biomolecule, which we refer to as ligand, uh, 
Um, and this interaction is detected within the evanescent field of the uh, gold surface. Uh, in terms of uh, the kinetic parameters that we can uh, detect this way, um, we can detect both the uh, very accurately the on rate as well as the off rate of the analyte in solution binding to the immobilized ligand. So initially we start out by uh, immobilizing the ligand onto the gold surface and uh, we then uh, inject um, the analyte in increasing concentrations and pass it over the ligand surface. As the analyte interacts with the mobilized ligand, we can detect that binding as a response, depending on the system, and we'll take a look at that in a moment. Uh, this response might represent a bro absorbance shift or a reflectance angle change. But uh, regardless of the uh, SPR platform, it, it, it basically you will get pretty much the same type of sensorgram readout. Uh, under these conditions, initially, as you inject the analyte, it will start binding free ligands on the uh, sensor surface. And initially, the, the, basically, the, the only driver of this uh, increase in the response will be the rate of association, how quickly this analyte is able to bump into the mobilized ligand and interact with it. Now, as more and more analytes bind, the mobilized ligand, some of the analytes will start to come off, and that is driven by the uh, dissociation rate, K off. Uh, so uh, really, uh, it, it, in, it, essentially, when, when during this association phase, we're talking about a, a second order reaction. So it is driven by uh, the on rate as well as the off rate. Now, once we uh, switch the... Uh, uh, SPR system, the fluidic system, back to buffer only. What happens is basically we will uh, instantaneously remove all of the analyte from the uh, fluid phase and we will replace it with plain buffer. So that will give us a chance to record just the off rate. So in, in fact, actually, when, we, when it comes to SPR analysis, this is the starting point because it's a first order reaction. So we can detect basically as we have only buffer uh, flowing over the uh, ligand with analyte bound. The analyte, as soon as it comes off uh, with the proper flow rate and in any SPR system, it is assumed that it is immediately washed away. So essentially, whenever the interaction happens within the association phase, it's assumed to happen only once. We don't want to see any rebinding. So that's part of the SPR optimization. And then uh, once we switch to uh, the dissociation phase, we can record the off rate which enables us then to go back and uh, based on that calculated off rate, uh, calculate the on rate as well. Uh, ultimately, uh, some of the uh, analytes or many of them do not fully dissociate depending on their properties. So additional step is needed, uh, which is re referred to as regeneration, uh, whether it's with an acid base or k tropic reagent uh, to uh, remove the remaining analyte and essentially have 100% of ligand immobilized available for subsequent analyte injections. In terms of different systems that can be used to study uh, kinetics, uh, a traditional SPR instrument, such as um, Saitiba's BIACOR uh, platform, uses um, uh, sensors that have uh, planar gold. So they, they are flat with a, a gold surface on top of it, and they have a fairly large evanescent field. So basically that would be the field of detection. It's around uh, 250 to 1000 nanometers. Um, the uh, instrument that we are using for our uh, antibody development analysis is Nikoya's open SPR instrument. It uses a slightly different approach to SPR. So it is actually uh, using sensors that are coated with gold nanoparticles. What it means is essentially these, uh, these types of sensors have much smaller evanescent field, which creates actually an advantage in terms of uh, the background that, uh, that is uh, much lower because of the smaller evanescent field, but still it is equally powerful in terms of in, uh, detecting specific interactions that are happening on the surface of the nanoparticle. So it gives us better signal to noise ratio and it reduces the uh, bulk shift it's basically the effect of uh, particles within the buffer uh, being detected within the evanescent field. So not the uh, interaction itself, 
but all but actually a signal coming from some uh, uh, essentially non-specific uh, um, components of the buffer uh, uh, passing through the evanescent field. So it's still this approach gives us a, a highly sensitive readouts and it makes the optimization faster. So it's actually ideal for um, antibody antigen interaction studies. Now we will start the uh, overview of the uh, use of SPR antibody development with SPR stability tests, and then we'll dive into the full kinetic analysis. So the SPR stability test is more of a binary screen, a yes-no screen, and it, it still uh, requires immobilization of the ligand on the sensor surface. In this case, we, are, we immobilized one of the two targets, P17 monoclonal antibody or CD3 uh, epsilon antibody on a carboxyl surface. So this, this type of immobilization is uh, driven by amine coupling. So it is a covalent bond. And uh, in the solution, what we have is uh, one of the uh, uh, clones identified in uh, the alpaca uh, repab project. So having those sequences and having synthesized recombinant antibodies for each of the clones, uh, we were then studying their ability to bind to the immobilized target, each of the two targets. In this type of screening assay, though, we were not injecting uh, increasing concentrations of uh, each of the analytes because we were not interested in uh, kinetics initially, but we were simply injecting a high concentration, usually with the antibody development pipeline, it's uh, in the range of 10 to 100 nanomolar, because really, if you don't detect <laughs> uh, antibody interaction in that range for, uh, and you're working in a binary uh, mode, uh, that means that uh, those antibodies are really either uh, not a very um, high affinity antibodies or they're not binding at all. Um, this is what immobilization looks like. Really what we are interested in is in, uh, capturing, immobilizing uh, target, in this case, uh, CD3 epsilon monoclonal on the carboxyl. So that's the yellow trace here. The, so that injection being followed by several of the uh, blocking and quenching injections. So uh, we have very good and consistent immobilization that enabled us to perform a stability screen. And for uh, this type of screening is uh, really powerful when it comes to having fast and accurate uh, analysis that actually identifies all top leads. Uh, endpoint assays are notoriously uh, sort of <laughs> uh, 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 weak when it comes to identifying high affinity binders that have uh, uh, fast off rates. And, and so there are some scenarios where uh, certain leads can be missed by standard endpoint assays. And uh, in case of SPR, uh, what, why, when we use this type of screen, um, essentially we would uh, do it when in early in the discovery stage with large antibody pools having uh, dozens or hundreds of antibodies. Uh, again, uh, performing it at a single concentration. We also can perform this uh, as a mutant screen, if we're introducing uh, mutations to a sequence antibody, as well as batch to batch QC validation, if you need a, a quick method. Um, so uh, the type of this type of screen essentially uh, uh, is not measuring the rate of association, but it is measuring the stability of the antigen antibody complex immediately at the end of the injection and also 30 seconds after the end of the injection, once we are flowing the buffer over the surface of the sensor. And it enables us to come up with these types of analysis where we can identify top binders, strong binders, and then also uh, weak binders uh, against the non-binding uh, clones. Here we're again plotting these response values, which are, correspond to absorbance shift immediately at the end of injection and 30 seconds later. In the case of uh, alpaca antibody set, uh, what we were uh, able to see is some uh, discrete preference for some of the clones. So um, we, uh, we detected in uh, using P17 as a ligand that R9 and R7 were binding with uh, very high affinity. So there were those top binders here against P17 and R9 was also found to be a top binder, uh, high affinity binder against the other target as well. Um, we see that R7 
is uh, here is forming a very stable complex with P17, but not uh, with the other target, CD3 epsilon, uh, while uh, R4 is uh, a clone that is binding both target, but, but it seems to have, at least in the stability screen, a little bit uh, uh, less of a response. Now we'll see that actually when it comes to affinity, on and off rate, it's actually performing similarly to uh, the our top binder, which is R9. And we can see here that we have one weak binder, R1, and then also R2 and uh, uh, R10 that are not binding to either of the targets. We can analyze this uh, in different ways. This becomes very useful uh, if you're having large antibody sets, uh, whether it's ligand-driven analysis or analyte-driven analysis, and you can get some um, uh, deeper insights there in that phase. So with that information in hand, we're then able to perform full kinetic analysis. So why would you do full kinetic analysis with surface plasma resonance? It gives you deeper insights into kinetic profiles of each antibody, and it also gives you highly accurate measurement of on and off rate. And why is that important? So I think this graph really nicely captures that in, in, in a simple way. So uh, here, what we have in, is an example of essentially uh, of, uh, several different um, binders that have all uh, identical KV, so the affinity of 100 nanomolar. Now, if you actually look at these binding profiles, they look very different. So the antibody uh, shown in uh, black is having a very fast on rate, uh, but at the same time, as soon as the injection ends, it has a very fast off rate. Again, KD representing the off rate divided by the on rate. So that gives us 100 nanomolar. And that antibody, again, if we're just uh, performing an affinity ELISA, for example, uh, or any kind of uh, affinity analysis, uh, it would look exactly the same as uh, this antibody here on the bottom, light blue. It has a very slow on rate, but also very slow off rate. So if you're uh, uh, looking for an antibody that is having a particular profile in mind, and maybe you're just interested in the off rate, this might be the perfect candidate. It's still binding. Maybe duration of your assay is on the order of uh, min uh, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, hour or longer. So this slow off rate might not be a limiting factor, uh, but this, this might be really the top candidate for further development, for example. So. Um, we can um, use this information then also to perform further antibody uh, optimization, antibody engineering, where having a sequence and having this type of information, we can introduce mutations that, that can then uh, give you just a perfect antibody for the application. Um, with uh, our alpaca antibodies then, we uh, again moved, in, uh, moved on and performed full kinetic analysis on carboxyl sensors. So these are standard carboxyl sensors that had uh, either P17 or CD3 epsilon antibody mobilized. And then in this case, we were actually injecting increasing concentrations of uh, each of these clones to get a nice uh, dose dependent set of responses that can then be uh, processed uh, in the analysis software. The software we use is trace drawer. It's a very powerful biophysical software, but there are many different ways that you can process SPR spectra. And the idea is really to, to get to this type of information. So here we have a, a visual summary of the, um, our entire uh, analysis, looking at uh, essentially the KD on the top, for all of the clones that are binding shown in green, as well as the weak binder in yellow. And uh, uh, with SPR here, we can see that we can also get very accurate on rate KA as well as the uh, off rate K off or KV. Uh, so uh, this is, uh, I, I think that there's um, no better example than if we look at R7 and R1 here that are specific binders for P17. So we can see that uh, actually, uh, if we uh, look across the board for all of the clones that are binding uh, P17, we see that R9 and R4 are binding with a very similar uh, affinity. So in a low nanomolar range, around two nanomolar, there seems to be a little bit more of a preference for those two clones against the other target, CD3 epsilon. Uh, but uh, here they're in the, pretty much in the same range. 
And if you look at the other two uh, binders, R7 and R1, we can see that R7 does definitely have uh, a little bit uh, weaker affinity, 7.3 nanomolar, and R1 definitely has, is the one that has the weakest affinity, so 41 nanomolar. Now, what is interesting here is actually uh, understanding why we're seeing uh, uh, this, these differences in the affinity. And actually, this set is a very nice example uh, because uh, here we can see that with the weakest binder, with R1, uh, actually, if you look at the on rate, Ka, uh, the on rate of R1, which is 1.5 times 10 to the fifth, uh, it's very similar in kinetic terms to R4 and R9. It's, uh, uh, again, this is uh, what we're looking for is several fold difference. So the uh, on rate being the same, what we notice here is that actually we discovered that it's only basically this uh, difference in the KD is exclusively driven by the dissociation rate. So the dissociation rate here being much faster for R1 than for R9, R4, and R7. So these three seem to be pretty much in the same range. They're very similar. But here we have, you know, instead of 3 to 4 times 10 to negative 4, we have 61.9. So dramatically faster off rate that translates into a much weaker affinity. Conversely, if you look at R7, actually R7 uh, has, uh, in terms of the dissociation rate, a similar dissociation rate to R4 and R9, but it's actually the, uh, the rate of association, how quickly this antibody is able to bind to the target that's uh, uh, really uh, making uh, the, this uh, uh, a lower affinity binder. So it is uh, having the association rate that's several fold uh, lower than R4 and R9. Now, imagine that you have 100 antibodies or maybe a dozen antibodies of, that you're analyzing this way. Uh, you can look at these numbers, you can make... Uh, uh, different types of uh, ranking analysis, uh, but what is a, a much more powerful co comparative analysis that you can perform is isoaffinity analysis. So here we're going back to the isoaffinity plot, and hopefully now it's going to make a lot more sense. So again, uh, with this type of analysis, what we are plotting here is we're comparing the uh, rate of dissociation on the x-axis against the rate of association on the y-axis. And again, because the KD, the affinity is uh, rate of the off rate divided by the on rate, we can uh, draw these diagonal lines right at the intersections of uh, the uh, two, uh, the on rate and the off rate that basically correspond to the KD ranging from one nanomolar to 10 nanomolar to 100 nanomolar. And you can imagine, again, going back to that example of several different antibodies having the same KD, here we would have those antibodies. Basically, if they were uh, if they were all having 100 nanomolar affinity, they would all be aligning uh, along this diagonal. But actually, the, the KD would be a result of very different on and off rates that, uh, in proportion, would give us the same KD, right? So going back to our study and uh, the type of uh, uh, kinetic profile that we are looking for is essentially in a clone. Uh, a, a monoclonal sequence from the alpaca polyclonal set that was having a, a, a that was being selected for this target, and uh, so that would basically give us R1 and R7, and also having high affinity, uh, less than 10 nanomolar, and also having a slow off rate, meaning once it binds, it remains bound for a long time. So R7 is the one that really meets all of that criteria. So that is our winner, and I encourage you to. Imagine what you know your winning candidate would be in your antibody de development pipeline. Um, so, to get started with this type of project, then um, basically all you need is uh, 100 micrograms of each binding partner, uh, each of the ligands and analytes. Here we had two ligands and we had six analytes. And uh, also, in terms of purity, we need fairly pure. Um, proteins, because again, it is a biophysical technique and the uh, accuracy of uh, final results really depends on having uh, these proteins at 90% pure or higher, and our turnaround time is uh, two weeks. Uh, we are uh, different from other services because of our reliability and reproducibility. Also the expert analysis, this type of deeper, richer insights that you can get from comparative analysis 
from customized approach to each project and uh, also our low sample requirement. So we are fast, responsive, and uh, do not have wait time with uh, most standard SPR projects. In conclusion, uh, I would like to invite you to explore our uh, uh, offering, whether it's the monoclonal antibody sequencing, polyclonal de novo sequencing that we discussed for alpaca or uh, other species that might be relevant to you, as well as the, our rapid SPR kinetic analysis, uh, as well as the HDX uh, uh, MS. We have the experience of over 7,000 successful proteomic projects since our foundation in 2015. Right now we're at 65 employees and we're serving 18 of 20 top pharma companies. And uh, also I would like to remind you to stay tuned for our next webinar. So this is not the end of the story. Uh, we do have a webinar coming up uh, in February that will cover the epitope binning as well as uh, epitope mapping using HDX. And this is just a sneak peek of that data set using the same clones that we discussed today. And I also invite you again to imagine what these types of technologies and the synergy between sequencing and uh, uh, kinetic analysis can do for your pipeline and for your next antibody project. Uh, please feel free to reach out to me directly if you have questions about SPR, or if you'd like to connect with uh, our, our team regarding um, any one of these technologies that we discussed, you can contact us through our website. We also have many resources on the website if you would like to explore this further. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and uh, I will bring back uh, Jennifer for, to moderate our discussion. Thank you, Marco, for the fantastic presentation. Uh, we did get some questions through the presentation, so I'll read them here and uh, yeah. Um, the first one is, why did you choose SPR over BLI for the initial screening? Does it have any specific advantages in the initial screening process? Yeah, so that's a, a very important thing to consider. BLI is one of the standard uh, techniques early in the antibody development process. Uh, the reason why we chose SPR even for the, the screening phase is the um, unique advantage when it comes to identifying those high affinity clones that might be having also a, a high off rate. So if you think in terms of like what we looked at in that uh, little diagram, uh, it, it would be the black trace uh, that if you look at you know, different types of uh, kinetic profiles that we can encounter. Uh, in, in general, BLI is a very good technology, but it is a dip and read uh, compared to uh, SPR that is a constant flow uh, platform. So it, uh, it is using essentially uh, a type of a, approach where we are uh, basically uh, creating an environment where each interaction is only happening once. So we do not have any rebinding events that actually make the analysis much more complicated. Thank you. Uh, second question, for the quick screen using SPR, did you use a low density immobilization for the ligand or a medium density immob immobilization for the ligand? Yeah. So. Uh, that's uh, that's also a very important point. Uh, and uh, in, in, in this case, we used uh, a low density mobilization. So in this type of screen, again, what we're looking at is antibodies used as analytes. So to account for the ability effect of, and the bivalency of the interaction, uh, what you can do with these types of, to perform a large screen using SPR, uh, essentially is that you can, uh, uh, have the ligand density is a, a very low end of the range, five to 10 micrograms per ml. And a third one is, is it important which way round you have your analyte and ligand? Should you always immobilize the analyte? Yeah, so it depends on uh, the uh, properties of the two binding partners. Uh, it, it Essentially, uh, ideally you want to look for the one-to-one uh, -one binding. Uh, so uh, if we are looking at, so in case of antibody development, if you're looking at the full antibody, uh, essentially you will have a, a bivalent interaction if you're running full antibodies as your analytes. So in, uh, in that case, you, you would want to immobilize uh, antibody if possible. Um, or you can uh, go back to uh, essentially what was the first question using 
uh, low concentration of your ligand. So in that way, you're essentially creating a scenario where there, there won't be that secondary binding happening once the, the initial interaction between antibody and uh, antigen takes place. Uh, in this study, what actually, uh, for simplicity, we didn't go into details of the clones that we um, screened, but we performed this study with uh, nanobodies. So we were actually with uh, BHH domains, uh, as well as, uh, so the, uh, basically that would be a, a, a monovalent interaction with the target, as well as humanized, uh, monoclonal uh, antibodies, and we're seeing uh, identical trends in this case, but that's not always the case. So yes, these are the types, types of considerations when it comes to antibody screening and full kinetic analysis that uh, you need to uh, take, in, take into consideration. So, so ideally, I would say if we move away from the uh, antibody antigen analysis, in general, if we're looking at one-to-one -one interaction, uh, really, uh, the orientation shouldn't make that much of a difference. So you should be able to get uh, a similar uh, readout regardless of the orientation. But again, with biological systems, it's not always the case. Thank you. And one last question is, uh, what type of sensors can you use? Yeah, so uh, in uh, what we, we have available in-house are all standards types of sensors. So uh, the uh, covalent coupling to carboxyl and amine sensors, as well as uh, planar gold uh, NTA sensors that were uh, that we can use to uh, capture uh, histag proteins, as well as biotin and sensors. So uh, basically this plethora of uh, sensors that's pretty standard with any platform, as well as functionalized sensors with protein A, protein G, and protein L. Oh, and uh, we, we got one more that just came in. Uh, we have a few minutes left. So um, is it possible to immobilize cells directly on the open SPR system uh, to do kinetic analysis on cell surface proteins? Yes, so um, that actually um, goes back to the, our discussion on, uh, about the size of the evanescent field. Uh, unfortunately, with uh, the open SPR system, uh, it's not designed for uh, cellular analysis. So cells themselves are uh, too large that they, they will, for the most part, they would be, if you, if you were to capture a cell on a gold nanoparticle, most of it would be outside of the field of detection, outside of the evanescent field. And also they're very heterogeneous. So uh, in that, with that kind of setup, immobilizing cells directly to uh, gold nanoparticles, uh, that's that would be quite challenging to get cons consistent results also due to heterogeneity of the cellular surface and lipid rafts right so it is not a plasma membrane is not a uniform surface with receptors being equally distributed uh, in that case i would say that uh, a, a bia core sativa platform is uh, more appropriate because it has a much broader evanescent field Super. Okay, I think that wraps up our Q&A session. I'd like to thank Marco again for the lovely presentation and thank all of you, our lovely viewers, for tuning in today. Um, you should be getting an email shortly after uh, with, with the recording. Um, but yes, feel free to reach out to us, uh, either Marco directly, his email's here, or reach out through our website if you'd like to chat about our uh, SPR service or um, any other of our uh, protein sequencing and characterization related services. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Looking forward to connecting with all of you. Have a great day. Bye. Bye.